I, I am Chris Lee. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ who happens to struggle with addiction and compulsive behavior. Uh, but we worship a God here tonight that's bigger than all those things, right? Yeah. That's right. So you're in the right place. Um, I also want to let you know that um, good news. Um, you don't have to put up with Mark. I'm here. Don't. It's okay. Everything's okay. Um, and uh, you might get to groups on time because I'm here. So... We'll see. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, because uh, cause Matt took so long earlier in 12 steps. So. Um, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I heard, actually, in a meeting beforehand that Mark's been standing up lately. Is that right? Yeah. It's about time. I told him years ago that one teacher standing up is as good as two sitting down. So it's, it's about time that you're standing up. Um, I, uh, some of you know me. I've been a part of this, uh, this recovery community for a while. Uh, some of you know me because I'm uh, Anna's husband, um, and I'm honored to, for that to be my title, too, uh, if that's all you know me as. Uh, just a couple things. I grew up in Sevierville uh, nearby. I, I am a worship leader uh, here in the, in the greater Knoxville area. Um, and uh, if you need some advice on, on good music, I only listen to good music. Um, and so I can show you my iPod, or you can ask me some of your, you know, artists that you're wondering if they're good. I'll let you know. Um, my favorite foods are sausage balls and ice cream. Together? Not together. It's disgusting. What's wrong with you? Um, <laughs> uh, separately, please. Um, please don't show up next time I'm here with sausage ball ice cream, because that's disgusting. Um, trust me, I've... I've tried. Um, well, some of you um, know a little bit of my story um, because of this community, but also a couple of years, a year and a half ago, um, Anna and I shared our story a little bit on uh, Saturday and Sunday services. Uh, and so some of you might remember some of that um, as, as we go through the night. I've been in successful recovery for almost 10 years. Uh, it'll be 10 years uh, in June. And praise God. praise God. Amen. But, but Anna and I haven't shared this story all that much. Um, I, for many years, was just kind of going up to step 11 and stopping. Um, because my struggle and my addiction is still, today, even pretty taboo, even in recovery circles. Um, but Places like this are breaking down those walls of uh, what's taboo and, and what's not. Um, but I got to a point where I realized that I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not going to be complete in my recovery ever if I'm not doing all 12 steps. And so, um, uh, because as we, as we read earlier, step 12 is having had a spiritual experience or spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we try to carry this message to others and practice these principles in all our affairs. So I'm doing what I can to do this 12 step as much as possible, be obedient to the opportunities that God gives me to do that. Um, my struggle, my addiction is with pornography and I've been in recovery since June 8th, 2007. And, and some of you might feel the same way. Like I feel like my addiction almost started accidentally. I mean, I realize that nobody, I mean, maybe there's somebody in here, but I would venture to say nobody says, you know, I've gotten to do a lot of things in my life, but I think, I think I'm going to try being an addict. I really want to do that. Nobody, nobody's going to say that, right? So, but I, I feel like I, I kind of stumbled into this. I remember being a kid. Um, I don't know, maybe a third, fourth grade, and uh, I was watching a movie that, that I had permission from my parents, and they just apparently forgot that there was a scene with a topless woman. And uh, I remember starting at that moment being intrigued. And over the next few years, there really wasn't a, a ton of stuff. I mean, I was a little kid. There wasn't a ton of stuff uh, except glances of things here and there, at friends' houses or whatever. But as I... Um, when I, when I got into sixth grade, that's when my recovery really started, I mean, uh, my addiction started spiraling out of control. Um, I am the son of a teacher, and um, one of my best friends at the time was a, also a son of a teacher, and uh, 
as some of you uh, who are teachers in this place know, um, sometimes you get to school early and um, your kids then have to go early too. And so he and I were there super early uh, every morning and we realized that uh, the school internet uh, had lots of stuff to offer us as sixth grade boys. And um, so that's when we started, um, I, I really started diving in deep into my addiction was through my middle school computers. Um, and, then, and then it was one thing after another. Like I had a cousin from a divorced family whose dad gave him magazines and he, he had friends that like snuck him movies that I would then take from him. Um, or, uh, you know, as I got a little bit older, there was, there was more and more access to the internet. And then I went to college where there was free internet and no accountability. Um, and so, so this is, I, I wanna take a second so that those of you who are parents take note. Um, I don't care what age kids you have. Um, if you have toddlers or you have teenagers, anywhere in between, you need to take note that I was full blown into my addiction and I never once spent a cent on it. This is, this is something that took a hold of my life and it found me and it was all free. I never once spent a cent. So if you have children at whatever age, they start getting phones and tablets and computers and stuff, you need to make steep boundaries on those things. And I'm not, I'm not saying you need to be helicopter parents. That's a, that's a completely different thing. I don't think that's healthy. But there needs to be healthy boundaries because when I was growing up, nobody was talking about this. Nobody knew. Nobody knew. The internet was, was, was so new, no parents knew to talk about it. They just didn't. It's not like my parents' fault. Nobody knew. There was no books. There were no studies being done on, on kids and the internet. It just, it just wasn't being done. And so... Um, now we know lots of studies have been done and there are effects that we can see all around us of, of the dangers of what the internet can do. Um, so do something parents, do something about it. But I, w I went to college, had no accountability, but I was in school for ministry. I went to school to be in the ministry. I was a spiritual leader on campus. I was preaching and leading worship regularly and I was dating a preacher's kid for goodness sake. Um, and all the while I had this addiction, this, this demon, that this thorn in my flesh that I could not rid myself of. And I felt so guilty and ashamed, which just took me deeper in my addiction, right? You know what I'm talking about? Then I got married to that preacher's kid, the love of my life. You know her as, uh, as one of your, one of your pastors here at Cokesbury, um, and I wanted nothing more to be fully open with her about what was going on in my life. But I had this thing that was going on that, that I was like, I felt possessed by. That I felt like, one, nobody understood. Two, I wasn't really sure some days if God could forgive me, much less my family if they found out. Because it was something that I believed was unforgivable. That's wrong thinking, um, if you don't know that, that's, that's unhealthy thinking, but that's how I felt. That's what I thought. And I know some of you know what I'm talking about. Um, but once again, I felt guilt and shame for having this struggle. I felt guilt and shame for not being able to share it with Anna. And I felt guilt and shame because apparently I was such a phony. You know what I mean? I was a phony because apparently I wasn't this, this strong Christian on campus like everybody thought and like I thought because if I really was a strong Christian and had this great faith, then I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't be eaten up by this addiction that I was a part of, which again was wrong thinking. It's not how it works, but that's how I felt at the time. And then on June 8th in 2007, I was, I was about to walk out the door um, with my guitar in hand to go lead worship for this large Bible study that Anna and I were a part of. And uh, that's when she figured out what was going on. And eventually everything came to light um, of what was going on. My wife, Anna, has been in my life, has been like the number one tool that God has used to show me what love looks like. Um, and uh, that was no different in my recovery. Um, she's been 
one of the greatest tools that God has used. Um, and now God continues to put more and more people in my life, um, uh, you know, leadership in the churches that I'm a part of. I have a great uh, small group that I was sitting backstage who were texting me saying they're praying for me and stuff. A couple, a couple of the guys in my small group are here um, to support me because they know uh, what I'm going through in my recovery. Um, so that's awesome. But about a year and a half ago, Cokesbury, um, this church on Saturday and Sundays, uh, they were doing a series um, called Perfect Imperfections. And one of the sermon series, one of the sermons in that series uh, was about forgiving others, uh, which is important in our recovery. So uh, I'm not, we're gonna, I'm gonna focus on that this evening, but, um, but that's certainly important. But one point, um, we, we, we had a video that, um, that was recorded that was used for that weekend about Anna's and my story of forgiveness through uh, my recovery process. And um, because the pastors and leadership, uh, they already knew our story and uh, just realized that that would be a perfect weekend to, to share that in regards to forgiving others. But in that video, I shared one little, little part um, that the, the most difficult part in forgiveness for me has been forgiving myself. And um, so that's what I want to focus a, a little more on tonight. We have, we have uh, some of you in this place may be like me. I, I usually feel like it's easier to forgive others than it is to forgive myself. Like somebody wrongs me, it might make me mad for a minute or something, but I usually am pretty easy to, f to forgive somebody, um, but not so easy to forgive myself. Um, and... As I'm diving into scripture about forgiveness, uh, it's easy, really easy, to find scriptures that teach us and instruct us on how to forgive others, right? There's tons in New and Old Testament. I'll, I'll share a few with you. So you've heard some of these. Colossians 3.13 says, Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Right? You've heard that? Um, Matthew 18 says, then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. And then in Matthew 6, this is the one that kind of like kicked me in the, in the mouth. Um, in prayer, there is a connection between what God does and what you do. You can't get forgiveness from God, for instance, without also forgiving others. If you refuse to do your part, you cut yourself off from God's part. And there are, t there are tons of others. Um, but you'd be hard-pressed to find some kind of teaching about forgiving yourself. But as I began to study intentionally in Scripture about forgiveness, I started to think, maybe I'm charged in the same way in regards to forgiving myself. Like, maybe if I don't forgive myself, I'm cutting myself off from God's forgiveness as well. Maybe. In that sermon, um, uh, in Perfect Imperfections, uh, Anna defined forgiving others um, by saying, the definition is to give up the right to continue to punish the other person. I think I, I'm a little biased, but I think that's beautiful. It's giving up the right to continue to punish the other person. And I think I can do that. You know, like, I think I actually probably, if I'm honest, do that fairly well already. But if we're going to use that for the definition to forgive ourselves, that would be you are giving up the right to punish yourself. And that seems a little more difficult for me. But forgiving ourselves is a little further than that definition, I think. It's not only giving up that right to punish ourselves, but forgiving ourselves means that we are fully accepting the freedom God offers us through Christ. Amen. You hear me? It's fully accepting the freedom that God offers us through Christ. And that's freedom from things and freedom for things. Okay, we got freedom from sin and death, freedom from darkness, from lies, from addictions, selfishness, pride. 
We're freed from so many things because of this freedom and, through forgiveness. But we're also freed for new life in Jesus. We're freed for truth and truth-telling, for selflessness and helping others. We're freed for humility. And the Bible says we're freed for freedom's sake alone. Galatians 5.1 says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Jesus knows how good freedom tastes and wants you to taste it too. It's for freedom that Christ has set us free. But have you, have you accepted that freedom? Have you accepted that freedom? Or are you choosing to stay enslaved and shackled to the things that are pulling you down into your addiction? Because here's the thing. God's granting us freedom. Right here in this place, God is granting us freedom. Wherever you are, whatever location you are at tonight, God is granting you freedom right now. You don't have to wait for some day or some time. God is granting you freedom right now. And the thing about freedom is it's not something you can, you can gain or, or go take or steal from somewhere. It can only be granted to you. In whatever situation freedom happens, it's only granted. It may even be in war, okay? We used to be under the rule of Britain, right? So we went to war with them and may, we might've been beating them, but we were only free as a nation when they granted us our freedom. We, weren't, we couldn't take it. They, we might, they might've been surrendering, but they granted us freedom because freedom can only be granted. And because of Christ's death and resurrection, we have been granted freedom in Christ as well. It's the same kind of freedom that we are granted every single day. But if you don't live in this freedom, you will never be who you could be, where you could be, or what you could be. You hear me? If you're not living in this freedom, you're being held back. You're never gonna be who you could be, where you could be, or what you could be. That's in life or in your recovery. You, you, you have gotten to some you know, block in the road if you are not living into this freedom through, through forgiveness. For me, the way that my own unforgiveness manifests itself the most is through the guilt and shame that I put Anna through and the choices that I made. And while we have, you know, walked arm in arm consistently through this recovery process, and I know she forgives me, I still have trouble shrugging off the shame and guilt sometimes. It's like, a, it's like um, I'm, I'm pretty well endowed, okay? And, um, and uh, <laughs> um, but it, was, it, it would be like if I tried to put my, my son's jacket on, my f I, I might be able to get my arms through, but it would be tough to get it off. You know, it'd be like Tommy boy, with fat guy in a little coat, okay? Um, it, you can get your arms in it, but it's tough to take it off yourself. But the thing is, is you're not doing it by yourself. You're, you don't have to take the jacket off that was too small by yourself. Christ is offering you freedom. Christ can take away that shame and guilt. Let's think about this in regards to, to baseball for a second. Any baseball fans? Yeah, okay, good. That's like two because um, <laughs> baseball is pretty boring. So um, <laughs> Matt's like, get him off the stage. Um, all right, go ahead. Those of you who like baseball, wherever you are, whatever location, go ahead and, and shout out your favorite team. Come on, Yankees? No, that, ever, any, any, anybody that yelled out a baseball team was right, except the Yankee fans. Come on. I'm pretty sure the Bible even says, thou shalt not root for the Yankees, Cowboys, or Patriots. I'm pretty sure. Sorry, sorry, Texas people. Uh, it might be, sorry, it might be in the Apocrypha or something. I don't know. Um, I should start, stop blaspheming. But, um, but when, when, when it comes to baseball, if you, if you don't necessarily know baseball because you, like me, think it's pretty boring, um, there are basically two kinds of pitchers, okay? There are starters 
who, who might play the whole game, but usually don't. And then there are closers, okay? Matt, you can, uh, you can jump in if I mess up something, okay? Um, closers uh, usually come in toward the end of the game for basically two reasons. Either your team is winning the game and you put the closer in just to bring home the win. You know, just, just stay, stay on the straight and narrow, bring home the win. And, uh, or your team is down, losing, and uh, you hope that you're going you're gonna to put this spark in to turn the game around and bring home a win, okay? So let's think about, let's think about this in regards to a pitcher, okay? Uh, you, have, you have this game going great. You're winning four to two. It's the bottom of the ninth. You put your closer in. He's going to bring home the win. It's, it, it's, it's a done deal. But something goes wrong and something else goes wrong and something else goes wrong. And before you know it, he has thrown a pitch that leads to a three-run homer to end the game and the team loses. Now, that game did not go as planned. (laughs) But he can't dwell on the outcome of that game. He is hired to be a closer and he's going to lose some and he's going to win some. But he's going to lose more if he, can't, if he can't shrug off that loss. Every time he goes up to close another game, he goes up to the mound, he's going to think about that game that he blew if he doesn't shrug it off and live in the freedom that he has another chance. Now, while I know this is the case for me, I still have a hard time shaking it off and moving forward. It's easier said than done at times, and I realize that some of what I'm saying sounds like it's easier said than done. But I promise, over time for me, it didn't happen overnight. It's been a process. I mean, almost 10 years where the shame and guilt and the forgiveness have been trading places. And if you consistently work the program work the steps, are intentional about your spiritual growth, I promise they will start, start, start training places. The shame and guilt will be less and less, and the forgiveness and freedom will be, be more and more. I know that ridding myself of guilt and shame and unforgiveness is possible because we serve a God that has done greater things than these in my own life. The God who forgave Peter for denying that he knew Jesus forgives me, and so should I. The God who forgave Paul for persecuting and killing Christians forgives me, and so should I. The God who forgave King David for cheating, for uh, lust, for killing off a dude, um, forgives me, and so should I. And so should you. God forgives you, so you should forgive you. Some of you come from worship traditions where you might know, be familiar with the Lord's Prayer. And one part of it says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. But the thing is, we've trespassed against us. We've crossed lines that God told us not to cross. But God also forgives us for crossing those lines. And if God forgives us for crossing those lines, God expects us to forgive in the same measure. I think that may be possibly a reason some of you are here tonight and are not where you could be in your recovery or where you would like to be in your recovery because of your lack of forgiving yourself. The band's gonna come out And as they they close us in song tonight, it's a perfect opportunity for you to be in prayer. If there is a major wall between you and successful recovery, and that wall is your lack of forgiveness for yourself, come up and break that wall down. Accept that freedom through forgiveness tonight. Don't wait. Bust down that wall and forgive yourself. Unforgiveness of yourself only hinders you in your recovery. You will only get so far until you fully forgive yourself. So don't wait. Come. God forgives you. God forgives me. And so you should forgive you as well. Come forward as we stand and sing. 
in the name of the creator, savior, and the sustainer. Amen.